welcome to this week's HSJ Health Check podcast. I'm Dave West, HSJ Deputy Editor, and each week we gather a cast from our team of expert journalists to explain and debate the most important news issues right now in NHS policy and leadership. This week I'm joined by HSJ Editor Alistair McClellan, Senior Correspondent for Workforce Annabelle Collins, and Senior Correspondent for Integration Sharon Brennan. We've been spoiled with big news stories lately, but we've settled on four things to talk about today. Firstly, the inquiry report this week about the Ian Patterson scandal. Secondly, um, West Suffolk Foundation Trust dropping its care quality ratings last week. Uh, Thirdly, unrest at the Care Quality Commission. And finally, the latest bout of CCG mergers, if we have time after discussing all that other important news. But let's start, um, Annabelle, with the Ian Patterson um, news this week, and listeners will have largely have read the the headlines and pr- perhaps some of the detail about the findings of the report. Um, but it, um, it, it it raises a lot of issues about medical accountability. Why don't you, you start off with your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just as a, a, a super quick recap, um, as what we reported um, earlier this week, so um, Ian Patterson um, was a surgeon working f- over a period of well, more than 20 years um, in the NHS and in the private sector um, in the Solihull area. And it's now come out there are over a thousand patients um, who he has um, treated um, over a number of years. Um, And as well as the kind of um, the results of the inquiry and the kind of initial recommendations, I thought it brought up um, some quite interesting points about um, regulation and um, the suggestion that actually is more regulation um, going to prevent this from happening again? And actually, is this about the much more difficult process of culture change and ensuring that people are um, staff um, at all levels across the hospital, which is really, really important, are happy to speak up. Um, And also around the accountability of managers and whether the very senior managers in an organisation are able to hold somebody to account um, for their actions and investigate properly. Mm hmm. Do I mean you? You raise was earlier. You raising the point particularly of you know there are substantial regulatory processes which have been put in place in the past that should catch this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's revalidation, which is something that um, all doctors have to go through. Um, If you're in training, it's a it's kind of an automatic thing, but um, consultants. it's um, something you have to do to retain your license. So this was something that was first brought in the late 90s um, as a response to a few NHS scandals, um, no, um, notably the, the Shipman, um, Shipman scandal and also um, the Bristol Hospital's um, paediatric um, cardiac um, scandal as well. So it was kind of a response to a few different things. And um, the idea behind that was to kind of, I suppose, catch bad apples um, and to ensure that all doctors are fit to practice and it kind of brought in the register as well. Mm. Um, but there has been a lot of criticism of reval- revalidation over a number of years. It's, um, you know, you could argue that it has been shown not to catch the bad apples. Um, you know, Ian Patterson was working up until, um, I believe it was 2011, um, which was, um, you know, over 10 years after revalidation was brought mm, in. So, mm. uh, yeah, you can, make, you can make the case that it doesn't actually help. Mm. Do you think that's why the inquiry team this time has kind of stopped short of any particularly strong rec- you know, major policy recommendations, arguably, haven't they? They seem to be... A- I mean, potentially, yeah. maybe because it, it, it links into other kind of policy being thought up, up at the moment around the, the people plan and kind of the leadership compact. And we know that um, there, have, there have been on, ongoing discussion about... Um, going back to the point about managers, about regulation of managers for a long time and whether this will uh, make any difference. And I think you can probably also bring in um, thoughts on whether the fit and proper person test has has that had any discernible impact at all on the quality um, of managers mm, in the okay. NHS. Okay, so a right, big issue that you think the yeah. NHS will seek to address some of these things through the through the people yeah. plan and response to the CARC, uh, CARC inquiry. Yeah, and this is obviously just the NHS side of things. Um, Pass and worked. At and it, across the NHS and the private sector as well, um, at Spire hospitals um, in Solihull. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah, so I that that complicates the situation because, well, then, it's I, I mean my understanding was a kind of communication between the NHS and the private sector, and um, was a failure. Non-existent, and yeah, the uh, clinical mm. governance is re- is very different. Isn't yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely about clinical governance and yeah, failure to listen and act. Okay, Alistair, your, what's your reflections on this one? Well, I've been um, I've been thinking about Patterson a lot, and um, 
how the NHS reacts to um, uh, terrible care failings like this. Um, I'm also at the same time f- have finally got round to reading Black Swan, Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, which is um, uh, the impact of uh, highly improbable uh, um, events. It strikes me uh, that um, Patterson uh, is a very definition of a highly improbable event. Um, uh, that this is uh, and uh, Taleb's definition of a highly improbable event uh, is that it is something that nobody nobody saw coming, uh, which I think is clearly true. That um, uh, um, uh, that it had something which was had an impact, which was very significant, and that in the aftermath, everybody says. Well, of course, of course that happened. It happened because of all these reasons. People are wise after the event. And um, it always strikes me that when we get an inquiry into these kind of events, there's always a desire to um, uh, solve a whole range of issues that, to a certain extent, outlie the um, uh, the particular um, issues of the case. In, uh, in other words things like professional manage, uh, regulate, regulation of managers. Uh, it was very interesting to hear Professor Syrian Kennedy um, of Bristol Inquiry fame and, of course, um, chair of uh, the CQC's prese- predecessor body on the Today programme, talking about how he believes still that there's a culture of... Um, uh, that it's very hard to hold senior medics to uh, um, to account uh, and that clinicians, so people within their profession and people who are to a certain extent meant to be manage them, um, fail, to, fail to do so. If, if you haven't read already, I really urge you to read uh, the piece that Alec Kafetz, who was an advisor uh, to the Patterson Inquiry, has written for, um, written for HSJ, uh, it is quoted no less in today's um, uh, lead editorial in the Times uh, on the issue, and there Alex shows how um, this issue is something which the NHS keeps returning to um, uh, in different uh, forms about this culture of responsibility, this culture of people speaking uh, speaking up, and um, you know. It's very interesting to see how the government responds to this because you get these kind of inquiries happening all the time in the in the NHS and sometimes they happen and there are there aren't that many implications from it. I think the a response to the Bristol inquiry was relatively low key because there was other stuff going on at the time. Um, uh, uh, lots of money being spent. Uh, lots of reform going on. The mid-staffs inquiry arrived during a period where the government w- needed something to do. It wanted a, a, a mission. Jeremy Hunt wanted a mission. And, um, of course, it produced a lot of change. Some of it directly from the report and some of it from the atmosphere or the, the impact that, were it, that, that it created. For example, the Keogh Trusts and special measures and things like that. It'll be very interesting to see whether... This government, we're getting a reshuffle next week, so we'll know whether Hancock is going to be still in, in, in post. What, whether this government uses any kind of launching pad to tackle care quality issues, or whether it just lets it sort of slide away, um, it'll be interesting. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Actually, no. Let, let me say, I bet that Jeremy Hunt um, uh, as new chair of the Health Select Committee, House Common Select Committee, will do an inquiry on the Ian Patterson um, uh, um, I think uh, he's even said it himself, so you can't can't win any money on that. All right, okay, (laughs) fine, all right, never mind. I hadn't heard that, honestly. Um, uh, But, you know, that conversation between Jeremy Hunt and Matt Hancock, like so many others, uh, will be absolutely fascinating theatre. And and Sharon, go. And actually, if you look, um, Jeremy Hunt took to Twitter... um, about 24 hours ago to voice some of his concerns and it does a lot of it seems to come back to what Annabelle was talking about that the recommendations don't centrally result on more um, on asking for more regulation because it's about we have the regulation and it failed it talks about the duty of candor which again goes back to the CQC and that they 
that's something that they look into. I was thinking, Annabelle, you were talking about the private sector, and we have these Freedom to Speak Up guardians with the, 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 the affiliate, well, the, the company, uh, Henrietta Hughes are set up, and they aren't actually in private sectors because uh, they, they have no regulation and no authority to put them in there. So there does seem something coming back to where the CQC was um, and is on, on some of these issues, especially as in the report itself, said that they didn't think they'd taken the inquiry seriously enough. Um, so it'd be quite interesting to see how the CQC evolves and adapts to mm. um, any of the recommendations within mm. it. Which just brings us neatly on, because I mean, the, the CQC that we are living with and, and enjoying at the moment is it was a response to the Francis um, and the, to Midstaffs and Francis in in the you know around 2014, 2015, when this kind of uh, chief inspectors and intensive inspection regime, Ofsted ratings, and uh, uh, David. Bian um, was brought in as chief exec of the Care Quality Commission, um, and and s- someone who sort of is highly capable and kind of oozes credibility. Um, brought the CQC into credibility, um, albeit um, often not liked by the people it's regulating. Um, and we were we also want to speak uh, to talk today about about the the, the C- where we've got to now, um, Sir David Bian left a year or two ago, um, a year or so ago, um, and a couple of developments have happened over the last couple of weeks, which have drawn attention to to the CQC's um, um, ability to to regulate and inspect. And Alastair, I think you were going to to talk about the West Suffolk change in ratings. Yes, indeed. I mean, uh, I, I will do. Um, but I think the first thing to say is, as you've hinted. Um, uh, uh, first of all, that running a regulator is really, really, really difficult. You end up saying lots of bad things, uh, inevitably, and good things, but bad things are what people remember about uh, um, a lot of people in the sector. Um, And many of those people are influential. And Sometimes, because regulators aren't perfect, sometimes those bad things are wrong. Um, And to run an effective regulator is, I think, probably the hardest job in public public service. Um, There's enormous expectation that you'll be able to spot every problem and sort it out. Of course, um, and again, Taleb talks about this in The Black Swan, the heroes of people who... Um, uh, who fix things that never happen? You know, if he gives us, ter- he tells a, a fantastical a- anecdote about the idea of a, um, uh, um, uh, a U.S. legislature passing a law uh, that came into force on the 10th of September 2001 that insisted all uh, cockpit doors had to be locked, uh, and therefore that the uh, 9/11 hijackers couldn't have uh, taken over uh, the, the planes. And he tells the story about how this legislation would be passed uh, and um, it was um, a load of people complained about it because it made life harder for airline staff, etc. And it passed into history without any, any particular uh, comment. And that's the lot of the regulator. If you spot something um, and you solve it, nobody knows about it in any kind of meaningful way. If you miss a care failing, everybody knows about it. And people like HSJ um, uh, will report on it and report on it in, in great depth. So I just thought I'd say that before I begin my comments slam on the, the CQC. <laughs> well, I, I am absolutely not going to slam the CQC because it is a, an impossible job. But in the light of say, in the light of that, it is clear what an absolutely brilliant job uh, Sir David Bean did at the uh, CQC. He took over a failing regulator. He took over a regulator at a time when the Secretary of State was really wanting to sort of up the ante on the, uh, on, on the front and for political reasons as well, and to get at the Labour Party as well as for um, uh, um, uh, uh, good, solid healthcare reasons. And he navigated that. He navigated... Uh, many of the staffing issues that were there following somebody like David Bean um, as the uh, as Simon Stevens successor will uh, discover is a really really thankless uh, task and of course when a perception grows that an organization is struggling then every event becomes uh, a sort of mini crisis and we've seen that in the story that is currently the most read story on HSJ 
um, at the moment, which is this row over paying for home workers uh, broadband. Now, readers will form their own views on whether people should be paying, uh, uh, whether CQC should be paying for a broadband for people who work at uh, work at home. Somebody makes the point that it's common for um, uh, um, uh, employers to play business expenses uh, to uh, some employers, uh, uh, some employees. Um, uh, then again, um, uh, um, uh, uh, many of the HSJ team work from home, and uh, sadly, our employer doesn't recompense us uh, for the cost of our uh, cost of our broadband. So you know, you pays your money, you takes it takes your choice, but. The fact that it's got to a situation where we've got five unions um, uh, threatening a vote of no confidence over over that issue, well, it's it's plainly not over just at that issue. It's a wider thing, and also there's a sort of bat and organisations who are struggling like that. They also attract sort of bad luck. So at the same time, in which they're having a big row with their home workers. They are one of the um, organisations, uh, government organisations that are moving out of central London. In this case, only as far as, um, uh, um, as Stratford in East London, near the uh, Olympic Park. But when it, a leadership which was more, more sure of itself would have been able to make the case, look, leave us for a couple of years where we are, We've got these cultural issues uh, uh, to sort out. The last thing we need to do, and everybody on this podcast will I'm sure know the most disruptive thing you can do is to move an organisation. Uh, give us a couple of years for us to, 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 to settle down. And I've made that argument and won it. And in fact, as far as I understand, a number of NHS organisations who were uh, going to move have made that uh, um, uh, uh, argument and won it. In other words, they will move, but not uh not quite yet now that internal stuff going on is a huge um uh, time sink and it means that the day job uh sometimes uh gets neglected now i'm not saying for one second that um uh cqc inspections and other work is is degrading in a noticeable way but it's inevitably going to take people's time and attention uh, 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 away f- away from it and when you get things like West Suffolk dropping two um, uh, um, um, uh, two ratings from outstanding uh, to requires Im- uh, to requires improvement, and in my mind, much more worrying when you get a whole swathe of mental health inpatient uh, units uh, doing roughly the same. the same kind of the same kind of thing. It immediately puts. Uh, what I repeat is this incredibly difficult job of a regulator under even greater scrutiny. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I think we wish, uh, certainly we at HSJ, we wish um, uh, uh, the CQC uh, all the best. But it is clear uh, from my long experience that this is an organisation which is, which is struggling and which is seeing events run away from it. And that, of course, is exactly what happened to the CQC under Cynthia Bauer before David Bean turned up. It's interesting you mentioned the um, the, the the fact that um, we're talking about the fact that the CQC came into this current regime under a, a pre, where the political appetite was there on the part of Jeremy Hunt, um, and now you know, there's the question of. Does the current government uh, decide to kind of embrace that uh, sort of uh, quality or safety agenda um, uh, uh, off the back of Patterson? I mean, my sense is being a regulator it does partly depend on the leadership of the regulator, but it also depends on the political appetite to support the process of that regulation, which I think has has been weaker over the last well, couple of years. Well, again, if I was to lay a bet, there is um, uh, there's a, a a pendulum that happens in uh, in regulation which is um, there'll be a big scandal amid staffs, for example, and the, everyone will say, we must, this must never happen again and we must basically uh, regulate to make sure it never happens, uh, never happens again. Then after a while, people start to say, well, this regulation is, is counterproductive and it's actually mean that we take our eyes off the ball, uh, we, we manage to the inspection, we don't worry about things... Uh, 
that we should be worrying about, etc. And then the pendulum begins to swing back. Um, remember, one of CQC's success uh, predecessor bodies was the Chai uh, Commission for Healthcare or, uh, Audit uh, uh, and Improvement and Improvement. Um, uh, um, uh, so audit and improvement. Um, and you get this idea that they should be a, a more sort of um, helping organisation rather than the criticising organisations. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, we could well move back in that kind of direction or or we could go even further in the other direction, which is um, uh, that, um, you know, um, inspection for example, the passing inquiry and calls for a database of consultants, you know, so that it, not only have you got basically CQC regulation of every organisation, you've got a CQC regulation of every uh, 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 of clinician. Or, and this is probably my prediction, is that this is a government which won't spend a lot of time on uh, messing with care regulation i think this government is interested in building things and hiring people and i don't think it's really interested in much else mm. though those are two huge issues of course mm. and on the yeah sharon i think the cqc also has a big challenge coming up because it's still as we move in from stps into these ics's that are meant to be set up by april 2021 um it still hasn't answered the question of what its role will be within regulating those um, providers within, within the ICS and what was interesting from the uh, appendix to the planning guidance that came out earlier this week is that I, the ICS and STP leadership will now be responsible for um, various things in the ICS such as workforce finance and also quality um, and so there is there is a part of the CQC where I have seen it try to think more about how trusts take ownership of their own quality and um, which is partly why I think they've moved more to a kind of an improvement um, kind of let's see how we can get you um, manage your own quality more. Um, but then you start looking at, well, how is an ICS going to overview its quality and how is the um, CQC going to hold only part of an ICS, i.e. the providers to account? And I could you could imagine more care issues going unnoticed because an ICS will end up having to look at, look after its entire patch and no one has quite worked out what they how they want to do that or how that will be regulated um, especially in a, in a scenario where your CCGs and your providers are meant to be working closer together and obviously the CQC only looks at providers and I think we did see with Matt, um, Matt Hancock was asked recently uh, recently declined to extend the um, kind of system reviews that the CQC was doing and then did extend them by a few, but now we're thinking there may not be that many done this year. So it really is quite a mess looking th- in the future. I think we could say that um, uh, we drew attention to the fact that the CQC wanted to do them and the government uh, uh, didn't want to do them. And uh, once we had indeed drawn attention to it, they suddenly happened. So they were just well. They just didn't, but they, 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 yeah, they suddenly said, well, declared they would happen. But the, you know, since then again, I mean, the attention immediately goes away from the. From you spoiled my story, Dave. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well obviously, we, now we've mentioned it on the podcast. I'm sure there'll be the inspectors will be dispatched to a health care system near you. Well, just uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, if I may usurp your role as chair and just uh, 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 mention that uh, I mean, this is a, a clear link to CCG uh, uh, mergers in that um, uh, the question of how you the question of governance and how you ensure quality in an integrated care system is one of the hugely long list of um, uh, issues that has to be um, uh, has to be reviewed just as um, whether or not you indeed get a single CCG for each um, uh, um, uh, for each uh, SDP. Jaron. So um, we have published a map um, this week. Um, apologies for those that saw the some of the countries uh, outlined in German. We're not quite sure how that happened, but it has been rectified. Um, and the map shows that the CCG... We haven't revealed some great conspiracy series to sell the <laughs> sell the NHS to the Germans. Although they won that big 2.5 billion contract, haven't they, the Germans? Oh my God, it, it started. <laughs> the German takeover of the NHS has started. You heard it here first. Um, so the map shows the CCGs that will, that will be merging in April. And we will go down from 191 to 135, which is about a 29% cut. Um, interestingly, that is lower than the number of PCTs we had in 2006. So Alistair talked about pendulums, and I think when it comes to um, commissioner sizes, we're going back 
uh, to where we were um, over a decade before. Um, we're seeing some interesting things. So some of the mergers are being pushed through good governance. Sorry, Heartland's um, uh, merger is going to include four CCGs and obviously they're an outstanding ICS. Um, we're seeing some mergers such as Kent and Medway, which is eight CCGs, um, which are coming together, but those CCGs still aren't actually working that well together. They still have internal in issues and conflicts. So they'll come together under one leader, but how they will work in, in, um, in future together is still to be resolved. Um, we have a funny little um, uh, amusing little C developed around Brighton Ho CCG. So both sides, there's two big mergers and they are sticking to their guns and don't want to merge um, because they fit nicely with their local authority and they want to continue to work in that way. So I think that also indicates the other part of the story that um, NHS England, yet again, in its planning guidance, said it wanted one CCG per SDP ICS, and they're just not going to get there um, by April 2021. That would be that would be the CCGs cut down to about 42, and we're expecting more like 60 to 80. And Brighton's a nice little example of why that might not happen. Yes, the um, uh, uh, Brighton once again expressing its independence. I, uh, what do we think? Tower Hamlets might be another one that would um, uh, that would fight uh, mm, long and hard for its. Uh, uh, for, for, for for its for its independence, I think they've lost this time. I mean, London seems to have rolled over for a for a change, so in, which in, in fact means we're going to get commissioners bigger than pretty much ever in, in well, for a very long time in the NHS in London. What, what whatever commissioners is going to mean in the future? Yeah, but I think that's it's an interesting question for for Sharon. Um, whether it's an opportunity to actually uh, all the talk is of abolishing the purchase of provider split and therefore there is no real commissioning job and so it's going to be hard for these new big CCGs to uh, find themselves a role but uh, I mean I wonder if actually the chances of a, of, a, of a bill of that excitingly there is a prospect of, of, a, of a kind of a, potentially of, of legislation actually scrapping the purchase of provider split but I think more likely is they ain't going to get around to doing something like that uh, the government so I wonder if there is a potential to build actually capable commissioners on a, on a big enough patch that actually they, they will be useful uh, will be will be able to do something so the more ICS leaders I talk to the issue about um, keeping grit in the system which Julia Woods talked about in her interview with us um, keeps coming up so even if the purchaser provider split was abolished there's still concern about how commissioners then hold um, providers maybe working as an alliance to account to deliver bigger contracts so I think that also is a question that if legislation goes ahead and it's been mooted potentially for autumn um, how you but then the, the proposed legislation won't abolish CCGs they will still be there the... yeah so Alistair you go ahead well, I mean, uh, <laughs> it is absolutely fascinating because I think there's a sort of view that, um, uh, in fact, I know there's a view that care integration is a good idea. So let's go towards it and we'll work out how we um, uh, sort out the sort of financial flows, which is effectively what commissioning is, uh, um, uh, which resources get spent on uh, what areas of operation. We'll sort that out as, uh, as we go along. Uh, one of my favourite games is uh, to, when I'm talking to a senior healthcare leader, I ask them, you know, what kind of system uh, the NHS will have in three to five years. And they always, and I stress always, give me a slightly different answer. So the last one I had was I had a breakfast with a very senior person on Monday. And they said, oh, well, you, we're moving to a hybrid market system. Like what we have. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, in other words, in other words, like what we have, but just watered down a bit. So this is sort of the less sort of mandatory uh, uh, mm, uh, element, to, element to it. And uh, Dave, I believe that I'm right in saying that in the legislative proposals prepared by NHS England, there is there is talk of uh, of of some kind of best like 1990s. Uh, though it doesn't say 1990s, but sort of best value test and things. In other words... Yeah. I mean, the most dramatic thing in the legislation is not a restructure. Um, CCGs will be kept, providers will be kept, you know, NHS England will be kept and enlarged. Um, the most dramatic thing is that is is, is scrapping competition rules um, and replacing them with a, a non-legislative uh, kind of complex set of calculations about when when you know, contestability should be used and things. So you think the legislation would say something like um, 
uh, a best value test must be carried out before a, a, a service is commissioned or something like that? It, it's something like um, a commissioner must have a view to uh, when they're deciding whether to whether to, to contract it at all to consider whether they're getting value as judged in a number of ways. Maybe you throw in things like social value and stuff so you don't yeah. destabilize. So it's it's uh, going to be absolutely yeah. fascinating because you could, you could see that in that um, scenario, loads of actors would want to... Um, influence it one way or the other so this happened right throughout the 1990s particularly the john major government in that the best value test was sort of um uh, particularly in local authority um, uh, um activities it was sort of you know moved until you got compulsory uh, compulsory competitive tendering uh in in many public uh, public sector and then labor sort of pulled back from it in uh in, in many ways and um I just wonder how much the government will want to clarify this situation or how much they will actually want to leave it quite vague and actually not have it because they don't want to have a big row about um, the NHS no longer being um, uh, no longer being able to sort of assure the quality uh, of um, uh, uh, their uh, uh, their healthcare services, but they don't. Have the, they want to get away from having arguments, and this government really does want to get have uh, arguments about um, uh, competition and and, and, and privatisation. So you know, who knows? Maybe even bigger role uh, for the Care Quality Commission because if you're if you're as Sharon was saying, if the Care Quality Commission is looking at the quality of integrated services, probably. Well, there are two things that it's got to look at. One is how integrated those care pathways are, which is, after all, the point of integrated uh, 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 healthcare systems, that the uh, the patients are moving, uh, organisational boundaries fall away and, all, and patients move smoothly through it. But also that those um, services are as good as they possibly could be and the organisations involved in it have the ability to check whether they're as good as they possibly could be, somebody's going to have to. Uh, somebody's you mean going. You to can do without the commissioners if you've if you've got a strong regulator to kind of come to come and check instead. It's w- it's the you know, argument. I think um, it has. Uh, yeah, argument was made. I believe under Jeremy Hunt, who obviously was enthusiastic for a big, powerful regulator, um, but. Uh, it would again take a dramatic piece of leg- legislation to shift the shift the decks, which I think I kind of agree with your earlier argument that actually they don't really want to do anything on the NHS apart from build and recruit and 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 try and avoid all the other issues. Yeah, but you know the system has to work in some kind of way, and the NHS is very. Um, I saw somebody the other day who says the trouble with the NHS is it, it it's very um, uncomfortable with uncertainty. It likes certainty, even when that certainty is tough like the targets and terror um, uh, uh, regime of the of the noughties it's just not comfortable with saying well you work it out for yourself i think we've seen that in many cases over the um, uh, last decade the, the, yeah indeed um well you can always find clarity here on hsj health check um <laughs> thanks for joining us um please if you've listened on the web please subscribe sign up to subscribe on uh, on your spotify or apple or whatever s- podcast app you have Join us again next week, spread the word, and if you've got any suggestions or thoughts, please do get in touch um, with me at Dave W. West on Twitter. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.